Good morning, Fellowship Fayetteville. Good to see you here today. My name is Andy. Uh, I've got the great privilege of being a part of our team here, leading our Celebrate Recovery Ministry, and I'm so glad to be here with you all this morning. You know, this morning we're going to talk about a really important event, and as I've been thinking about it, it's in, in just the, these ideas of important events that happen in our life, they, they deserve to, to be celebrated. And when they're not celebrated and, and when, they, when they're missed, it just, it just feels off. It feels wrong. Y'all want to hear a really awkward story? <laughs> it was May of 2008. It was just a couple weeks before my 17th birthday. And, you know, growing up, I'd never really been like a really popular kid, but by the end of my junior year of high school, I had made a lot of the right friends, and, uh, you know, it felt like we were hanging out all the time, and, uh, you know, we were basically at this point where we were always just kind of looking for an excuse to hang out, and so as, as May hit, I, I, I had a great idea. Uh, my birthday was coming up uh, just right around the time that the, the end of the school year was. And so I thought, what a great excuse for us to just get together, have a bonfire, celebrate the end of the school year, and then we can celebrate my birthday too. You know, that'd be kind of neat. You know, me and my brothers, we never really like invited friends over for, to celebrate our birthdays. And so I thought, hey, why not? This will be fun. So I asked my parents. They said, sure. My mom got really super excited to cook a lot of food for all of my friends. And, uh, you know, this was also back in the time where you actually, like, printed out, like, paper invitations to stuff like this. And so I did that, as was the custom, and I handed them out at school, and then I just waited for the big night. The party was going to start at 7, and so when 7 rolled around and it was just me and my family there, I didn't, I didn't freak out. It was a party. It wasn't a business meeting, and so it's not like they needed to be on time. 7.30 rolled around, and Still nobody, but that's okay. Like, you know, we were having a bonfire. They were probably going to wait until, you know, it got dark and, you know, we lit the fire. And then at 8 o'clock, my best friend in the entire world, Bobby Jaycox, showed up. And then at 8.30, <laughs> Bobby left <laughs> because he was just popping in to say hey. Now, I could continue going on with the timeline for the rest of the night, but I think we all kind of know where this is going. <laughs> nobody else showed up. And we just ate barbecued hot dogs for the next week, me and my family did. I told you it was awkward. Told you it was going to be awkward. Important events, they deserve to be celebrated, and it feels weird when we don't, especially because we're, we're so good at celebrating things. As people, we just love celebrating stuff, whether it's uh, sports or, or, or birthdays or, or holidays. I mean, I remember how nuts my wife and I went the, the first time that my toddler used the potty on her own. Like, we love to celebrate. And so when big things go uncelebrated, it feels really weird, doesn't it? Today, we're going to talk about one of the most significant events of the life of Jesus that tends to get missed and a little under-celebrated. We absolutely celebrate Jesus a lot, and that's a good thing. We celebrate his birth at Christmas, his death at Good Friday, the resurrection at Easter, but the last great event of Jesus' earthly ministry, we often miss the ascension of Jesus. And this morning, I want us to look at it so that we can see why this is so worthy of celebrating. Now, first off, you might be wondering, what in the world even is the ascension? What do we mean by that? Well, the ascension is what happened at the end of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances, where he left the world to be with God the Father in heaven. Some scholars call the ascension the climactic event of the resurrection. It was the final goal of Jesus' earthly ministry, and it was the, the handoff between the earthly ministry of Jesus and, and the ministry of the apostles and the church. And there's two places in Scripture that recount this event. They're both recorded by Luke. And the first one that Amy just read for us is at the end of the Gospel of Luke. It's just four verses long. And it, and it seems to give a little bit of a condensed version of, of what that looked like, where Jesus led the disciples out to Bethany, which is over around the, the Mount of Olives, uh, Jesus blesses the disciples, he's taken up into heaven, and then the, the disciples go to the temple and worship. 
It's as if as Luke was ending his gospel, he knew he was going to be writing his friend Theophilus another volume, and he was going to go into more detail there. This is kind of a Spark Notes version of it. And that's exactly what we find when we look at Luke's second volume, the book of Acts, in the very first chapter, in the first 11 verses, which is where we're going to be anchoring into today. We see a much more full description of what happened and the content and the promises of Jesus' blessing there. It starts off with Luke uh, giving Theophilus a quick recap of, of what he, he told him previously in that gospel account. That uh, uh, He said he wrote to him about all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. And then he gave some additional content text saying that after Jesus rose from the dead, he stuck around for almost a month and a half about how long I promoted my birthday that nobody came to, but I digress. But it was about 40 days. It was 40 days teaching them of the kingdom of God, proving that he really was alive. And then it it goes on to detail Jesus's final conversation with the disciples, where he tells them about the coming of the gift of the Holy Spirit, that it's coming at last, and that after he leaves them, they need to wait in Jerusalem for the Spirit to come. The disciples get really excited hearing about this, and, and they start wondering if the, if the restoration of Israel that they've been awaiting for is finally coming. And they ask Jesus about it. Jesus lets them know, hey, it's not, it's, it's not for you to know the times and the dates that the Father has set. But then he gives them a promise and a purpose. that The Holy Spirit is going to empower them to spread this good news to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus ascends. He's taken up into heaven, hid behind a cloud, and the disciples can no longer see him. Then we're told that as they're standing there, two men dressed in white, two angels, appear, and they gently rebuke them, reminding them, hey, you guys just had a conversation with Jesus about what you're going to do. And by the way, Jesus is going to be coming back the same way that he just left. I know for me, this story was one that I'd never really looked into a whole lot in my life, never really paid a whole lot of attention to, but I think what we'll see this morning is just how important this is, how it's such an incredible encouragement of Jesus's heart for you and I and a detailing of the mission that God has given us as the church to take part in. What we'll see specifically in the passage is an incredible promise, a renewed priority for us as Jesus followers in the presence of Jesus's heart before the Father for us. So let's jump into it. First off, we see there's an incredible promise that Jesus gives of the coming of the Holy Spirit and what that really means for the disciples. Looking at verse four, we see Jesus sitting with his disciples there and he gives them the command to to stay in Jerusalem to wait for the promised gift of the Father. He, He lets them know that they've talked about this before, both before the cross and after the cross and and that that time is finally near. He explains why this matters for the disciples. The Holy Spirit is coming to bridge the old and the new and and to empower them for this mission that Jesus is going to detail later. Jesus says that John baptized with water, but here in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit, that there's a bridging and a shift that is happening between the old and the new that God himself is orchestrating. And then in verse 8, we see Jesus promising that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on them. And so why this indwelling and empowerment? It's so that the disciples can spread the good news to the world, starting in Jerusalem and rippling out to all the earth. You see, Jesus is setting them up for what their purpose looks like after Jesus goes to be with the Father. And in doing so, I love this, he's letting them know that he's not setting them up for failure. You see, anything that Jesus truly calls us to do, he will also enable us to do. Jesus knew the task that he was giving the disciples was far bigger than they could ever accomplish on their own. And he never planned on leaving them alone in it. Yeah, it reminds me a lot thinking about just right now in my life my, and just the craziness that's going on in our family. We've got, my wife and I have two kids. We've got a, a like a, two and a half year old and like a 13 month old because we're really bad at math and planning. And, and our house is just absolutely nuts right now, especially with this nightmare that we call potty training. 
I don't know if anybody's ever had to deal with that. I wouldn't recommend zero stars. Would not recommend. And, and I love my daughter, Harper. She is one of the greatest joys in my life, but I couldn't tell you what I would give to just help her understand the concept that we go potty in the potty. Not in her car seat, not while she's cuddling with mom on the couch, not on the way to the potty while daddy's holding her, in the potty. And I could get frustrated about it and thinking like, man, what is wrong with you? Like, this is not that hard. We're gonna have to buy new carpet here. <laughs> But then I've, I've got to step back and I've got to realize what a ridiculous expectation that is, that I can't blame her. She's just a little slow like her dad. And, and my daughter's going to need some help. And I want nothing more than to watch my daughter succeed any way that I can. And you know, Jesus, he understood the task. He understood what he was asking and what the disciples needed. And in his love, he promised the Spirit would come to guide and empower and direct them so that they actually could spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, a.k.a. Arkansas in 2023. <laughs> Jesus knew that the early church was going to need the Spirit and his empowerment. And he wanted them to know that because he was getting ready to reframe their priority and what their focus was going to be. Now, I want to just say this real quick. I love the disciples because I just, I, I just feel like they're just so normal and so human, and I feel like I probably would have been the exact same way. And it, time and time again throughout the gospel and, and even right here in Acts, we, we see the patience that Jesus displayed in his interactions with the disciples when they just seemed to just not quite get it. And that's super encouraging for me for the times that I just don't get it. it. It gives me a model for how Jesus looks at me in that. But what I love is I think we're gonna see that same patience and love at work as Jesus resets their priority here in verses six through eight. After Jesus explains that the Holy Spirit is coming, that they're gonna be empowered to spread this good news of Jesus' resurrection, the disciples ask a question. They ask Jesus, hey, is it time for you now to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, first off, this is a really good question for them to ask. You see, from my vantage point, I can look at that and go, man, did they, just cut, did they miss the whole kingdom of God stuff? Like, we're, what are they thinking? Like, come on, guys, he just talked about the Holy Spirit. Let's focus on that. But as, as Jews, this is actually a really good and completely appropriate question for them to ask. You see, they've been awaiting the coming of the Messiah to come and restore the kingdom of Israel. They've seen Jesus resurrected. They know that he's the Messiah. And so this is the next logical step in their understanding of it. But it's a good question. It's an important question. But I love Jesus's response here. Jesus doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't get frustrated and throw his hands up. He simply says, hey, it is not for you to know the times and the dates that the Father has set. That's a good question, but it's not the most important question for you to focus on right now. Then he goes on to turn their attention to a new priority that comes with the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, I'm giving you power so that you can go and be my witnesses to spread the message of the gospel to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. Jesus takes their good question, he expands their vision, and he gives them a new priority that is going to drive them and the church after he ascends to the Father. And it's actually the last thing that he tells them. And what I love just about the disciples in this story is that even after Jesus ascends, they need another nudge and a reminder. You see, in, uh, remember the angels that came after Jesus was taken up into the cloud. And I, I wish I could have been there to know what the disciples were going on, probably just wondering what just happened. Like, do you see him? I don't know what's going on to you. And these angels, they show up and they offer a gentle rebuke. They just go, men of Galilee, what are you looking at? Why do you keep staring up there? Jesus was taken into heaven. And he's coming back again. Now it's time for you to do what he just talked about. And as we read Acts, to their credits, the disciples did that. They went to Jerusalem. They received the Holy Spirit. They replaced Judas. They went and got to work spreading the, the, the good news of the work of Jesus. They stepped into the new priority that Jesus had given them. 
And as I look at that interaction with the disciples and Jesus and the disciples with the angels, there's, there's a thought that kind of came up for me. Just kind of wondering, what are my priorities right now? Am I focusing on good questions rather than focusing on the right question? See, there's, there's a lot of things going on right now in our lives, our world, our culture today. And I know for me, one of my tendencies is to get really sucked in to certain things, whether it's politics or cultural issues or issues I see with my generation or even within the church. And, and even though I might approach some of those things in a really good and genuine and healthy way, if I'm not careful, I can get tunnel vision. I can get distracted from what my primary purpose is. And I can find myself in this angsty and angry place that's just no fun to be, and it's no fun for anybody to be around me either. I can get in a really unproductive space where I'm preoccupied with good secondary things, standing off, looking up into the sky, and in doing so, completely missing the most important thing, which is loving Jesus and making him known. See, there's a lot of good questions for us to ask. But are we okay if God tells us that those answers aren't for us right now? Could it be the case that God is more concerned with us living in deep relationship with him and focusing on the things that we know he's asked us to do? It's important for me to check my priorities from time to time because I know I'm prone to wander off track. And so I'd just ask us, what are our priorities right now? Are we focusing on maybe good secondary things and missing the primary things right now? Can, can we obey what we know about God's will for us right now? Something to think about and ponder this morning. The last thing we'll look at in this passage today is the actual ascension of Jesus. What that means for us and how because of it, we have the presence of our Savior with the Father. In verse 9, we get a, uh, just a really just kind of simple explanation of the actual ascension moment. Jesus gives the disciple a new priority and mission, and then it just says that he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Now, I wish I could tell you all of the physics that were involved in all of this, but I have no idea outside of what the text says. And the best that we can understand is in that is that Jesus rose into the sky, into the heavens, wrapped in the clouds, and the disciples couldn't see him anymore. When the angels come, they tell us that Jesus was taken into heaven, and that's it. And while it may, may seem like there's not a lot of detail there, I think we actually do have a really good idea of what happened here. Especially if we look back at, at a place in the Old Testament that Jesus loved to reference and that the disciples were really familiar with and I'm sure was on their mind as they saw this. Michael took us back to that place last week and I wanna go back to it again. It's Daniel chapter seven, verse 13, where Daniel describes in a vision before him one like the son of man, which by the way was Jesus's favorite title for himself. The Son of Man coming with the clouds into heaven, approaching the Father, approaching the Ancient of Days, and being led into his presence. When we look at that, it seems a little familiar, doesn't it? Jesus taken up on a cloud into heaven to be in the presence of the Father. And then the angels tell us that, hey, in just this same way that Jesus left, he's going to be coming back again. You see, it's a promise that Jesus hasn't left us on our own or forgotten about us, but that one day he's gonna come back again in the same way that we watched him go. It's a promise that he's coming back again to establish his kingdom here on earth and to make all things new. And in the meantime, Jesus is in heaven with the Father and he's there to step into the next part of God's plan for us. You see, if you notice in the first verse of the book of Acts there, Luke says that he wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. You see, Jesus is still alive and he is active and involved in creation and even our very lives today because he's alive. He's risen. 
You see, Jesus completed the, the, the work of salvation completely through his earthly life, death, and resurrection. And because he's the resurrected Savior, we can know that our hope is complete and total in him. But yet the story isn't over. There's, there's still a mission that the church has to do to spread the good news and the good work of Jesus. And, and we wait for him to return. And we're in this season of already and not yet. Jesus has won And we're waiting for him to establish his kingdom here on earth. The ascension was the climax of Jesus' earthly ministry and the handoff between the disciples and the church. And through it, Jesus stepped out of time and space to be in the presence of the Father. Why? Because you see, Jesus isn't finished. He lives presently Right now, in this moment, Jesus lives. And he is doing something right now. You see, he reigns as king. He sees us. He empowers us and enables us through his spirit. His heart is still for us. And in the book of Hebrews, we get one of the greatest examples, one of the greatest glimpses of what the ascended Jesus also does for us. Hebrews 7.25, it says, Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. You see, right now in this moment, Jesus stands before the Father interceding for you and I. And I know that that word might not seem super familiar, but an an intercessor is a mediator. It's a go-between between two parties to make peace between them. It's the same thing that the priests did in the Old Testament as they offered sacrifices for people's sins and, and pled to God on behalf of the people. All human priests were broken people like us, but right now in this moment, Jesus acts as our perfect priest and mediator between us and the Father. You see, he offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice. And now he stands before the Father, advocating for us, interceding for us, praying for us, and bringing before the Father the fact that we are covered continually by the cross. And him and the Father celebrate that together. And please don't miss this, because this is one of the biggest reasons why the ascension matters for us today. That because Jesus is ascended and interceding for us, he's able to completely save those who come to God through him. Jesus' presence before the Father, it applies the work on the cross so that we're saved completely. And that word completely in the Greek is the word pentelis. It conveys completeness, comprehensiveness, exhaustive wholeness. It can also be translated to the uttermost. That means that the saving work of Jesus, it touches every part of our life. That when we come before God and place our hope and our faith in Jesus, that no matter how broken, no matter how shameful, no matter how trenched our sin is, no matter how to the uttermost we are broken, Jesus saves us to the uttermost. Listen to Dane Ortland. As he talks about why this matters. He says, we all tend to have some small pocket of our life where we have difficulty believing the forgiveness of God reaches. We say we are totally forgiven, but there's that one deep, dark part of our lives, even our present lives that seems so intractable, so ugly, so beyond recovery to the uttermost. In Hebrews 7.25, it means this, that God's forgiving, redeeming, restoring touch reaches down into the deepest crevices of our souls those places where we are most ashamed, most defeated, and more than this, those crevices of sin are the places where Christ loves us the most. We cannot sin our way out of his tender care. I want you to think about that for a second, though. What part of your heart seems so intractable, so ugly, so beyond recovery, Where do you feel most unlovable? And hear this. The heart of Jesus is most strongly drawn to our most broken places because those are the places where we most strongly need his tender love and grace because Jesus lives to intercede for us. 
Right now, I'm walking through my eighth uh, Celebrate Recovery Step Study group. Some of you might be thinking that's a lot. I've got some stuff to work on. I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> but as I've been jumping in to this group, I, I've noticed there's a, an abiding lie that just plagues me of this idea that my worth and my value is tied directly to what I can give and produce for people. And I know as I've been thinking about that, I've had this feeling that it's going to be, I'm having to deal with some codependent tendencies that I have, some perfectionistic tendencies I have, you know, really fun places of my heart that I'm just chomping at the bit to look into and dive into. (laughs) You see, it's not that I I necessarily always want to go to those places, but I recognize that I need to be honest with myself if I want to grow closer with God. And, and me personally, I'm still working through all of this. But one of the things that I am seeing in my life right now is that first off, my brokenness goes way deeper than I ever initially thought before. But also that God's faithfulness is way deeper than I could have ever imagined. You see, there's a part of me, and maybe you relate with this, there's a part of me that always kind of flinches a little bit at the idea of bringing the fullness of my brokenness to Jesus because there's this doubt that lingers in the back of my mind that thinks maybe this is gonna be the thing that exhausts his patience for me. And I was talking to some guys uh, a couple weeks ago about this idea, and I, I said, I know that that thought really is a lie because every time I have brought the worst of me to him. He showered me with his love, help, comfort, and healing. It didn't matter if it was years of shame that I carried for the sexual brokenness in my life. It didn't matter if it was my struggles with alcohol. It didn't matter if it was the 13-year pornography addiction in my life. It didn't matter if it was the grief or the fear or the shame. Every time I had the courage to bring God into the darkest parts of my life, he's faithfully and lovingly stepped into it. Because the joy of Jesus' heart is to bring light into dark places. And I want to pause right here for just a moment because I know what I just said right there, it may seem impossible for some of us here in this room. For some of us, the darkness may be really, really deep right now. We may feel like we're alone in our pain. We may feel like we have lost hope. And we want you to know this here. As a church, we're here for you. You don't have to act like everything's okay. In fact, we know everything's not okay because all of us have brought baggage in here because all of us are broken people that live in a broken world. This is a church where you really can come as you are. We actually prefer it that way. And that's one of the biggest reasons why we have Celebrate Recovery here at Fellowship Fayetteville, why it's a part of our church, so that as a church we can walk together, closer to the hope, the healing, and the purpose that's found in Jesus. Every Friday night, we, we come together and we, we hear stories of people that have found healing. We encourage one another. We remind each other that we're in this together, and we point each other towards the hope that's found in Jesus, in the same ways that we do here on Sunday morning. And I want to encourage you, if, if you're in a hard part in your life, or if you've just never come and, and checked out Celebrate Recovery, No matter what your story is, we meet every single Friday night at 7 o'clock over in the student center, and we would love to see you there. You see, you're you're not alone, and there is nothing that we walked in here with us today that Jesus isn't willing to enter into with us. You see, we are deeply broken people, but the love of God goes far deeper than our brokenness. And you might be wondering, how, how can we really know that? Well, let's look at what the angels say. Last verse of our passage here. They say, this same Jesus has been taken into heaven. This same Jesus. You see, the same Jesus who right now is alive before the Father interceding for us is the same Jesus who walked the earth. The same Jesus who took on flesh, was born in a manger, died on a cross, was raised to life. The same patient Jesus who interacted with the disciples here in Acts and and whose life we see in the Gospels. That means when we see the heart of Jesus towards sinners and sufferers as given to us in the Bible, 
we are seeing who Jesus is for us today. Don't miss that. That means that in the same way that Jesus patiently loved Thomas and his doubts and disbelief, he loves me when my faith grows thin and I struggle to believe that Jesus is alive and with me. In the same way that Jesus wept with Lazarus' family when he died, he weeps with me in my loss and he never leaves me alone in my grief. In the same way that Jesus touched and healed the leper that was seen as unclean and unlovable, he draws near to me in my sin, in my brokenness, in those places where I feel the least worthy. In the same way that he restored Peter after after he denied him, he doesn't cast me off. He doesn't cast us off when we fail. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. He welcomes us back. The heart of Jesus hasn't changed. He's alive. He stands in the presence of the Father living to intercede for us in this moment to empower us for the mission that he's given the church. And in the same way he left, one day he is coming back again. That's the beauty of the ascension. That it promises us and reveals to us our hope for tomorrow. Our purpose for today. And the unchanging heart of Jesus. As we go into this time of worship, I want to ask you, which one of those do you need most reminded of today? Is it that he really is coming back again? And therefore, we have a hope that supersedes our circumstances today? Is it that he's given us a mission to carry out and we can find our entire purpose and belonging in him? Or is it the one that I know I need to hear? That the heart of Jesus has never and will never change. That he sees you. He knows you. He's for you. And if you've placed your hope and faith in him, he's able to save completely all who come to the Father through him. As we sing, and as we consider that, ask God to encourage you in what you need to hear.